Title, Today's Destiny. Principle. Scripture teaches Christians who exclude themselves from the future through preoccupation with the present suffer judgment. Turn to Ezekiel, the seventh chapter, verse three. We're going to look at several different extremes of preoccupation. Ezekiel, seventh chapter. Now is the end come upon thee, and I will send mine anger upon thee, <clears throat> and I will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. So here he's talking about their doings, which are evil. <clears throat> They've been preoccupied with doing evil wickedness in the present, and he's letting them know that the future is going to be a judgment because of what they're doing in the present. It's just a linear progression to a point of <coughs> what would be considered recompense. <coughs> Turn to Matthew, 24th chapter, verse 50. He's referring to God's people, Israel. Chapter 24, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him as portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, same principle, Old Testament, New Testament. The individual that is preoccupied in the present with evil, and does not take into consideration the future results of what he's doing in the present is going to suffer judgment. Overwhelming judgment. Now turn to Luke the seventeenth chapter, <coughs> verse twenty six to thirty one. <coughs> And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day Noah entered into the ark, the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. The same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he which shall be upon the housetop and the stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Now, we find a principle here. Everything that he's referring to here is not of itself evil. Planting, reaping, buying, selling, marrying, giving in marriage, eating and drinking is not of itself evil. But we see the same principle. That is, the preoccupation with it unto the time of a future in which the individual is not prepared constitutes a judgment. He's talking here about people going about their daily lives enmeshed, immersed in 
the present. <coughs> there is a time in the future in which those in the present are going to be overwhelmed, whether they're doing wickedness or whether they're just living normal, natural lives. The same destiny overtakes them all. Death. There were people in Sodom and Gomorrah that weren't doing any specific wickedness at the time the city was destroyed, but they were in the city and they got wiped out. Lot's wife wasn't doing wickedness, but she got taken out anyway. <clears throat> what is the principle? The principle is that the scripture teaches those who exclude themselves from the future through preoccupation with the present suffer judgment. Luke 21, verses 34 to 35. <coughs> Eat to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, and cares of this life so that they come upon you unaware. So you have two principles here. Surfeiting, which is greediness, gluttony, drunkenness. These are evil participations. But it says the cares of this life <coughs> and the cares of this life. So it's joined, it's a conjunction. People who are preoccupied with the normal activities of life are just living life. Not necessarily doing anything reprehensible or evil or wicked. They're just living in a preoccupied concern with the concerns of life. Notice what he says. Both of these together. <clears throat> and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all of them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So what's being said. The problem it's preoccupation with the things of the present. In that preoccupation, it's going to cause them to experience a judgment that they are not prepared for. Now, Scripture teaches the main cause of Christians focus on the present. The main cause of Christians focus on the present will be the influence of men. Turn to Isaiah, the second chapter, verse 22. Cease ye from man, whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of, or reckoned with? He's talking about humans. If you're a son of God, then humans should have a limited influence in your life. Extremely limited. God reserves the preponderance of influence in life, not man. The reason the Christians are going to suffer is because of their over-dependence upon the influence of men to make decisions for them. And man is limited by his preoccupation with the present. Men do not prepare God's people for the future. They prepare God's people for the present, a perpetual present. Leadership of the church is preparing the congregation for life in the present, not the judgments that are about to come. Turn to Second Peter, third chapter, verses three to four.
Knowing this, <coughs> first, the there shall come in the last day, our time, scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the Father fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They neutralize the thinking of people to look to the future. Everything is continuing as it was. There's no change that we can determine, no change in the offering. Focus on the here and the now. Whether you're committing evil or whether you're just living your life normally. This is what Peter is saying. Where's the proof of all of these things that you claim are going to come upon the earth? Don't worry about it. It's no problem. When you look at the mainline denominations, that's exactly what they are feeding their people. Matthew 24, verses 4 to 5. Not only the mainline denominations, every aspect of society is programming its adherence to the here and the now in no change to be anticipated. This answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. This is speaking about the main obstacle to having Christians being open to the Holy Spirit who will give them, lead them into all truth, dealing with the future is men, man's influence. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. <clears throat> Second Timothy, fourth chapter, verses three to four. For the time will come, our time, they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They have been so programmed by human reasoning that they shut down the influence of the Holy Spirit and they want to satisfy and gratify the curiosity of the senses and they'll flint from one thing to another going after those things that are sensational. That's why the churches today are shutting down true worship and they're going into this choreographed light shows which uh, display uh, of beautiful scenes and uh, displays of a flowing, rhythmic um, harmonious <coughs> activities which allure the senses but have absolutely no effect on the spirit. Jude chapter 3. Or rather, Jude verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So here Jude is saying that the faith, the body of teaching, the doctrine, has been relegated to a a fraction of what it once was. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom shall go into every nation. The gospel that was once delivered has never been totally restored. And of the 
that which is restored, only a portion of it is even gone into. And it deals with the salvation aspect of it. The kingdom aspect, the heritage aspect, all the principles dealing with life in the kingdom are not emphasized. In order to understand those, a person has to research them on his own. People, the, the, the proof of the pudding is that people don't even realize what the word church means. When you mention the word church, you think of a building, not the body of Christ. <clears throat> so we're living in a time when everything is focused on the present. <clears throat> everything that's given to God's people is spoon-fed in a rid rigid, rep repetitive, <clears throat> limited package and really has very little significance <clears throat> to what it once was. This us to the next principle. Scripture teaches the church will continue to decline <clears throat> under the present leadership of men until the beginning of sorrows. At this time, <clears throat> it will again be revived and those who are open gathered together. In other words, there's a split taking place by Christ. Those Christians that are closed to receptivity of the future versus those Christians that are open to it. The church is going to continue to decline until the calamities and catastrophes begin to take place, the shakeups in society take place, and then those that are open to the Spirit, those that have the vision for the future, those that watch, are all going to be gathered into communities. The others will be in society, <coughs> left to their own devices. It's in Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 9 to 11. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Now this is a principle. Paul is saying, God the Father will make this principle known to everybody that's open to receive it. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. Now, <clears throat> this gathering talks about it's gathering in one, all things that are in heaven and on earth. So it's alluding to a connection between those things of Christ in heaven and those things of Christ on earth. The gap is no longer, is no longer a separation, which is diametrically the opposite of the rapture. At the rapture, there is no connection between the heavens and the earth. The connection is broken. Those that are in heaven are separated from those on earth. Those that are in heaven have been taken from the earth as a unit. Those that are on earth are left basically to their own devices. When Jesus said the door is closed, when he said, I know you not, <clears throat> when he said, uh, basically cutting off uh, those that are evil, those that are wicked, it's referring to a separation. So Paul here is referring to a gathering, a unity of one, which takes place at the time of the formation of the communities. The Holy Spirit is going to be poured out <coughs> on a global scale. <coughs> the power of the Holy Spirit is going to fall on His people. Apostles and prophets will be raised up under the power of the Holy <coughs> Spirit. They will be the shepherds over the communities, the angelic um, emissaries in the heavens being the connection with those on earth, giving revelation because society at that time, the scriptures, the written scripture will not be available. The Luciferians 
through deception, through chicanery, through outright <coughs> coercion, are not going to allow society to have access to the scriptures. The communities will have access to the word of God through angelic communication, but the Christians on the outside will not. Only until <clears throat> the martyr, the persecution takes place after the rapture, will this gospel of the kingdom again go around the world. And it will go around basically through word of mouth. <clears throat> but the word uh, will be spoken in the same context that the written word is now spoken. A lot of changes are going to take place. And those that aren't prepared for them are going to find themselves in a situation where they will undergo tremendous deprivation, tremendous judgment, <clears throat> tremendous strife. Those that are prepared because they have watched, they have made themselves available, expecting these things to take place, are going to benefit from it. <clears throat> Title, New Preacher Mysteries. Turn to 2 Corinthians, 5th chapter, verse 17. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. <coughs> now this is a statement that gives us an understanding of exactly what has happened when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. If anybody has been born again, he is a new creation. New creature. We want to take a look at what the scripture says deals with the <clears throat> aspect of this new creature. Scripture teaches as new creatures development takes place on the inside of the old creature. 2 Corinthians 4th chapter verse 16. Right across the page. Second Corinthians four, verse sixteen. <clears throat> For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So what the scripture is telling us is the vision here. He talks about the outward, he talks about the inward. The outward has its own identity, characteristics, desires, traits. The inward has its own identity, characteristics, desires, and traits. It says here, Second <clears throat> Corinthians, fourth chapter, verse sixteen, that the outward, the outer creature is perishing. It's corrupting. It's fading. It's dying. The inner is renewed day by day. So there's two separate things that are happening simultaneously. <clears throat> the problem that most Christians have is that they're not aware of what's taking place on the inside, only what's taking place on the outside. Scripture teaches the new creature has a totally different awareness and set of desires than the old creature. Totally different set of awareness and desires. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, 
we want verse 16. Right above where we started. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. What is he saying? <clears throat> this is said just before he goes into, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, new creation. He's saying, as a new creature, you do not see people, the world, the Lord, as you saw him before. The word know there means discern. It's saying, <clears throat> because you have become a new creation, you're going to see all things differently. You're going to know, be aware of all things in a different perspective. That's the problem that we face. The new creation, the new creature, has a different agenda than the old creature. So you reach a point where there's a divide that, that takes place in every single life. And a choice has to be made. Which one do you go with? Which the set of desires, which set of goals do you incorporate in your life? Now the church basically is not teaching people the ability to make this, to make the change. They're trying to teach people to become a new creation in the light of the old creation, to become a better person, to become somebody that's uh, more perfect, uh, sinless, flawless. And people can't deal with that because that's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says one must die and the other must live. One has to dominate and the other has to subjugate, become subject to the other. <clears throat> Only when we become aware of these desires do we become aware of the reality of what's taking place on the inside. <clears throat> Romans, the seventh chapter. The desires of the new creature, radically different from the desires of the old. Romans 7, verse 22. <clears throat> Seven verse twenty two. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So Paul is saying his desire is to flow with the desires of the new creature. The new creature delights in the law of God. What is this law of God he's referring to? What is he talking about here? He's not talking about the law of sin and death, that's what dominates the old, the outer man. The law of God he delights in. Romans eight Right across the page, verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, the old man, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Paul talks about two laws that operate <coughs> in the life. <coughs> the law of sin and death, the law of the spirit of life. The law of sin and death affects, influences the old creation, the old creature. The law of the spirit of life, which the new creature, new creature delights in, operates <coughs> in a <coughs> totally different way. The law of the spirit of life, if followed, would lead to freedom. The law of sin and death, if followed, will lead to bondage and death. Each one, the old creature, the new creature, operates under two different laws. Now the law of the spirit of life opens the door to eternity. The law of the spirit of life enables <clears throat> the new creation, the new creature, 
to operate in a radically different way than the old creation. <clears throat> Scripture teaches the inner creation, inner creature is created for life in heaven. Its desires are heaven-centered. It focuses on its destiny, which is in heaven. That's its prime directive. That's what the lump sum total of all its desires are, is to operate in the same way on earth as it would operate in heaven. That's why the scripture tells us we take on the divine identity, <coughs> righteousness, peace, love, joy. We operate on earth as though we were in heaven. We take on the heavenly lifestyle. That's the desire of the new creation. Turn to Colossians, the first chapter, <coughs> verse 12. the first chapter verse 12 giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light the new creation is a creature of light it dwells in the element of light its total desires revolve around the element of light because light is its destiny <coughs> It has been made, designed, created to inhabit the regions of light. <coughs> Colossians, the third chapter, verse 2. <coughs> Colossians 3, verse 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. This is the desire of the new creature. <clears throat> In essence, the new creature has no affinity at all for the earth. No desire for the things of earth, nor does it identify with the earth. It's totally a... <clears throat> Its desire is totally neutralized with the things of earth. The scripture teaches this. Turn to Romans, the sixth chapter, verses three to six. Thirty-six to three. Romans three. I mean, Romans six, verse three to six. Yeah. Oh, three to six. Yeah. Not thirty-six. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have to start wearing my hearing aids. Verse 3, Romans 6. <coughs> know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. In other words, Baptism is a symbolic representation of something that happened to us. We died. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism unto death. We died. We cease to exist. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. He dies to the things of earth. He rises as a new creation to the things of heaven. <coughs> he shows us 
He is the forerunner. He is the type that sets the example. He was resurrected not for life on earth. He's resurrected for life in heaven. The first of a race called the brethren. And that is the same path that we follow. When we get baptized, it's an open identification. We're identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've died to the things of earth. And now we've come alive to the things of heaven in eternity as new creations in Christ. Baptism is an open identification of something that has already happened. We've been created new. <clears throat> and it's a declaration. We're declaring. I've died to the things of this life. And I'm alive to the things of heaven and eternity. Now, Scripture gives us that consistent understanding. Uh, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians, 5th chapter. Verses 1 to 2. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 2. For we know if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, <clears throat> we were building of God in a house not made with hands eternal in the heaven. In other words, the only thing that connects us with the earth at this point is our body. When that connection is broken, we automatically ascend to the heavens, <clears throat> to a residence that's already waiting for us. Verse 2. For in this we groan, or moan, or sigh, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. The Spirit earnestly desires the conditions of heaven. It's earnestly desiring. <clears throat> That's this main desire to ascend to its house in heaven. You notice what it says, why this is. Verse, drop down to verse 5. <clears throat> Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. God put the desire in the new creation. That would be its earnest desire to ascend to its <coughs> destiny, its home, its abode in the heavens. God is responsible for that. Why? So that the life dominated by the Spirit would progress in maturing to the point where it's preparing itself for life in heaven. It's following its desire. Everything on earth, as far as the spirit is concerned, the new creation is concerned, <coughs> does not identify with anything dealing with the earth. <coughs> Case in point, turn to... Um, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 47 to 49. Corinthians 15, 47 to 49. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So Paul makes this distinction. The first man he's referring to, of course, is Adam. <laughs> Adam <coughs> was created for earth, because to be a custodian of the earth, to dwell in the earth. Verse 48, As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly the distinction. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. If we are new creatures, then our destiny is heaven. We progress toward heaven. That's our goal. That's our desire to prepare ourselves for our ultimate residence. This is what Paul is talking about. 
Therefore, everything that we had before of earth is no longer a functioning aspect of our life. Talking about the spirit, the spirit's desire. <clears throat> Give an example. Turn to Galatians, third chapter, verse 27 to 28. Galatians, what chapter? Third, three, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And when he says put on Christ, he's talking about the new creation. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You lose your earthly identity in the new creation. The new creation doesn't identify with male, female, American, German, Japanese, black, white, none of that. <clears throat> the new creation identifies with the identity of Christ solely. All the attributes of earth are lost, are dead, as far as the new creation is concerned. <clears throat> it takes on a heavenly identity. <clears throat> Two. Colossians, the third chapter, verses 9 to 10. The new creation has the attributes of its creator. Colossians, the third chapter, oh, third. Mm -hmm. verses 9 to 10. <clears throat> no longer is limited by the human attributes of the old creation. Colossians 3, verses 9 to 10. Why not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man for his deeds? In other words, the old identity is neutralized. The new identity is dominant. And I put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. Notice what it says. After the image of him that created him. Who is the creator? God. Whose image did he create us in? Christ. Renewed in knowledge. In other words, a new creation has a capacity for infinite knowledge. Because it's patterned after its creator. <coughs> in that, new creation can absorb knowledge revelation knowledge that nobody else can. Old Testament saints can't because they were never regenerate. New Testament saints can't. That's why we read the scripture, 1 Corinthians, turn over to 1 Corinthians, 2nd chapter, verses 9 to 10. Corinthians 2nd chapter 9 to 10 but as it is written I have not seen nor ear heard he have entered into the heart of man the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him so nobody has ever seen nor imagined what God has prepared for those in Christ the new creation for God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things yea the deep things of God the new creation, spirit, can absorb 
all these things because it's created to do so. To take upon itself, it's been created all things, A-L-L, -L, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine all things and show it unto you. Who's the he? The Holy Spirit. Who's he going to show it to? The new creation. How is he going to show it to him? Through supernatural revelation knowledge. Because the new creation is, is created to receive infinite knowledge from its creator. That could not be done under the old covenant. That could not be done with unsaved people. It can only be done with regenerate new creations. The new creation was created for infinite power. Turn to Ephesians, first chapter, verses 17 to 21. <clears throat> First chapter 17 to 21 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him so Paul is saying here the prime directive of a new Christian is to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit where he can gain revelation knowledge and power for service Eighteen, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints that's revelation knowledge what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward in other words his power from him to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. So he's saying the power that works in our spirit is the same power that took Christ from earth outside of the creation, beyond every heaven, beyond every principality, beyond every angelic intelligence, and set him back at the right hand of the Father. The same power works in us. Ephesians, the third chapter, verse 16. <clears throat> he would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with my power by His Spirit in the inner man. We are renewed daily, and the Holy Spirit powers us, strengthens us with the same power that raised Christ in the inner man. The new creature is a creature of infinite power, infinite revelation knowledge. Ephesians 3, verse 20. to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think that's infinite ability capacity according to the power that worketh in us powers in us Jesus said the work that I do shall he do and greater the power is there revelation knowledge is there everything is there what is the problem the problem is the human mind. The problem is the opposition between the flesh and the spirit. The problem is that our minds innately by nature stand in opposition to the development of the spirit. As simple as that. And unless we know how to deal with it, 
then we become limited because your mind will put you in a situation because the mind is subjective, not objective, like the spirit. The mind will put you in a situation which every situation it puts you in, you're going to experience limitation because the mind focuses from the senses. And the senses perceive limitation in the physical realm. And that's how people operate their lives. That's where they get the belief system from. From the information that goes from the senses to the mind, through the brain, and calculate their abilities or their inabilities. <coughs> but the spirit doesn't have anything to do with that. The information the spirit gets comes from a totally different source, not the senses. It comes from the spirit of God himself. And it's all-knowing, omniscient, omnipresent, <clears throat> all-seeing revelation that the Spirit is consistently receiving, but it is blocked in transmitting it to the mind, because the mind won't receive it. The mind has a priority system of things in which it will receive, in which it will reject, being programmed by Satan, society, and the senses. That's why the early church was able to perform all those acts, all those miracles, and later on, <clears throat> it fell into total neutrality because people became carnal. They lost the spiritual focus and the power that went with it. And that's why the church today is weakened. <clears throat> but it's going to be changed in the very near future. So what we find here, your spirit has a set of desires and those desires are to prepare you for life in heaven while you're on earth. Those desires are to enable you to walk and function supernaturally. To think supernaturally. Not to receive limitation. But to look beyond the limitations at the, <coughs> at the prospects, the challenges that are put before you to overcome. They're not put there before you to cause you to become a victim. They're put there so that you can use them as challenges and grow and become greater and greater and greater. There's nothing in this world, in the scripture says, that will overcome us if we are connected with Christ through love. Nothing. If everything should be looked at merely as a challenge to be overcome.